Hey guys, what's up? Today we're going to look at some partial fraction strategies for Laplace transforms, inverse Laplace transforms, things like that. So a lot of times when we're solving differential equations, we have uh, Laplace transforms. Eventually we need to invert those Laplace transforms. And a lot of times they're a mixture of things in the denominator that we need to split up and we use partial fractions to do that. So the first thing we want to do is remember quite a few of these Laplace transforms and the first translation theorem and, and things like that. So the first one, Laplace transform of e to the at, this is going to be super important, is 1 over s minus a. The second thing, Laplace transform of t e to the at is 1 over s minus a squared, and that's given by the first translation theorem. So this right here is just the first translation theorem. And we use that first translation theorem so often when we do these inverse Laplace transforms that we need to keep that in mind. The second row, we got some more Laplace transforms. Laplace transform of e to the at sine of kt is just k over s minus a squared plus k squared. This is the first translation theorem again. So this is first translation theorem. This is first translation theorem. And this is first translation theorem. So it's Laplace of e to the at uh, cosine kt is going to be s minus a over s minus a squared plus k squared. So this is just the first translation theorem being applied in all three cases here. And these are the most like these are the most common Laplace transforms and inverse transforms that we'll see whenever we're solving differential equations. So the the key is to look at the denominator of something like this. We have a numerator and a denominator, and the denominator typically we'll just start off with s squared plus m s plus c in the bottom. So we want to look at this denominator and how it factors, and how it factors tells us how to use our partial fraction. So the first case is we get two distinct real roots when we factor this denominator. So if it factors as like s minus 2 and s minus 3 or something like that, then that would be this first case. So the denominator factors as s minus, we'll say r1 for root r1, and s minus r2. Again, that could just be like s minus 2 and s minus 3. If that happens, partial fractions that we use are a, a over s minus r1 plus b over s minus r2, and those are our partial fractions that we'll have if we factor into two distinct real roots. Now, whenever we go to take the inverse Laplace transform of those partial fractions, we'll just get exponential functions from that. So Laplace inverse of this first partial fraction would just be a e to the r1t. And then the second partial fraction, Laplace inverse, would be b e to the r2t. So that's our strategy when we can decompose into two distinct real roots. We just get two exponential functions. If we decompose the denominator that has a repeated root, so for example, we factor it and it gets like s minus 1 squared or something like that. So maybe we can factor it as a repeated root. Then our strategy becomes a times s minus r plus b all over s minus r squared. So this is when we have a repeated real root. So when we factor it like that, we write our partial fraction decomposition like this. And when we break that up in the numerator, that's going to become a over s minus r, because the s minus r would cancel with the square, plus b over s minus r squared. And now, taking the inverse Laplace of those, the first one, a s minus r, is just going to become a e to the r t from up here. And then b over s minus r squared, well, that's this case right here. That b can come out, and then it's just t e to the r t. So this is our strategy when we have a repeated real root. This is typically what's going to happen. It could be repeated like a higher degree, like it could go up to like s cubed or s minus r cubed. Then we would just have another factor c over s minus r cubed, but not too much different. All right, so lastly, if our denominator factors into complex roots, then we have to complete the square in the denominator. So completing the square in the denominator means we have to take half of m, square that, add and subtract it in the denominator, and then eventually we'll get to a form that looks like s minus mu squared plus lambda squared. And in the numerator, we want to make that numerator look like this somehow. I'll show a, an example in another video of how to do that explicitly, but this is how we want to set up our partial fractions whenever we have complex roots, mu plus or minus lambda i. Right? So once we do that, it will decompose. And if we look at the pieces, split them apart in the numerator, you get a times s minus mu over s minus mu squared plus lambda squared. 
That looks a lot like this cosine shifted transform from the first translation theorem. And same thing here, b lambda over s minus mu squared plus lambda squared. That looks like the sine shifted transform using the first translation theorem. So inverse Laplace of these two added together is going to turn into a e to the mu t cosine lambda t plus b e to the mu t sine lambda t. So we're using the first translation theorem in reverse in the second and third case of how we factor our denominator. And that's our strategy for when we're finding inverse Laplace transforms. Specifically, this is going to come up a lot when we do differential equations. When we get the solution, we have to invert it. And a lot of times that involves doing a partial fraction decomposition.